name is Richard Vasco, and I have a few titles, but perhaps the most important one is that I'm a priest of the Diocese of Albany, New York, and I am the presider at the liturgies at St. Vincent de Paul Church on Madison Avenue in Albany, New York, every Sunday. But in an unusual twist, I make my living not as a clergyman, but as someone who since 1970 has earned his living as an architectural consultant specializing in religious art and architecture. So since that particular time over the past 40, 45 years, I've been helping Christian, mostly Catholic, and Jewish congregations who are planning to build or renovate uh, their places of worship, that is their sanctuaries, their, their places where they gather uh, for weekly worship. My career path uh, actually started when I was in high school, uh, like you're in high school, and I took art courses there, and I went to a Catholic high school, and in addition to playing a lot of sports, uh, and being a fairly good student, I began to notice a connection between religion and art. And I had some wonderful teachers who encouraged me to practice my artistic abilities and talents at the same time that I also began to uh, learn about and appreciate more about my own religion, which is Roman Catholic. So when you ask about when I first thought about this career, that's where it started. And then I went off to study uh, theology and philosophy, and it was at that particular time that I was entirely focused on religion. And I was not entirely focused on art and architecture in my early college years. That happened later. And I'd like to say that what's very important for any a young student today who's thinking about what career to follow, and there are many, many careers to follow, that an interdisciplinary a background will help you most of all. And it's in that regard that I would like to share with you that I have been privileged to have an interdisciplinary educational background. So. The first place that I went to study was right here in Albany, New York. It was a seminary that is closed now. And after two years, I received an Associate of Arts degree. And then I went to St. Bonaventure University, a small Franciscan Catholic school in the southwestern part of New York. And I completed my two years of college there and earned a Bachelor of Arts in the field of philosophy, which I really liked a lot because Studying philosophy helps you learn how to think by, by examining all the men and women who have been philosophers down through the ages. And once I finished the Bachelor of Arts degree there, I stayed at St. Bonaventure University in Christ the King Seminary, where I earned a Master's of Divinity. And there is where I matriculated and studied for the priesthood. So in 1969, I was ordained a priest uh, by Bishop Edward Broderick right here in the Albany Diocese. So after ordination, when I was assigned to teach in high school at Cardinal McCluskey High School, which is now Bishop McGinn High School, um, I began to do more work in the field of art and architecture here locally. And that would have been around 1970-71. And it occurred to me that I needed to go back to school to learn more. So off I went to the University of Notre Dame, and that's where I received a liturgy degree, a degree in liturgical studies, which really focuses on how different religions worship when they come to church or synagogue during the week. So there I earned a Master of Arts degree in that highly specialized field of liturgics. So then I continued to go to work, and locally then the bishop here, Bishop Howard Hubbard, uh, gave me permission to practice in the field of church art and architecture full time, which meant that I did not have any responsibilities here in the Albany area. And I said to myself, I need some more education. So back to school I went. So 
If any high school student is listening to this, I want to encourage you and others uh, not to give up on education and to get as much education as possible because that's going to be the lock and key combination to your success. I then went to Syracuse University where I did two more degrees. I did a master's in fine arts where I learned much more about art and I did a doctorate, a PhD, in the field of education where I focused on architecture. And my architectural studies there helped me understand the connections between church architecture and the way in which people behave. So that's my area of research, how people behave in certain architectural settings. And I know you wanna talk about this church, and so we can explain about how this uh, arrangement of seats in this building is really a reflection of studies dealing with how people behave in certain architectural settings. This church is an older building. It's one of the older church buildings, Roman Catholic church buildings in the city of Albany. And it's designed in a Greek revival style. And on the inside, at one time, you probably say it's sort of a classical interior. Unfortunately, in the 1980s, a fire uh, destroyed this part of the church building and it was renovated in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council. And it was really a fine renovation that made an effort to bring the people closer to the altar area and to provide uh, a setting where people could see and hear in a wonderful environment. Uh, many, many years later, 40 years later, uh, it was decided by the parish leaders here, uh, Betsy Roe Manning, who was the new uh, parish life director, the pastor of this community. Um, she replaced Sister Joan Byrne, who uh, for a year was the administrator after Father Leo O'Brien uh, retired. And he was here for a long, long time. So what we sought to do here is to create an environment for worship that would draw people closer to the ritual actions that take place on this platform, which we correctly call the sanctuary in our Catholic religion. It might be called a bima in the Jewish religion. It might be called a chancel uh, in some Protestant religions. Uh, but you can see here, we have no barriers. This platform is barrier free. It has a ramp so people of all abilities can come up to the top level. We created a special area for our music ministry. We hardened the materials in this room and we put in new LED lighting to save on energy. We have a baptismal font that is entirely barrier free uh, so that people of all uh, abilities can be baptized in it without feeling embarrassed and the like. But the premier feature of this particular space is its centralized plan. Now, a lot of people would say that this is highly unusual, but if you study uh, Christian art and architecture, you see that this kind of a setting where the people are gathered around the holy table really dates all the way back to the earliest places where Christians worshiped, primarily in their homes. And then it wasn't until a new kind of clericalism was established in the church that gave more prominence to the clergy that the important parts of the worship place, the altar, started to be removed from the people. And then down through the ages, the people, uh, really did not participate in the mass like they did in their homes, they became spectators and they started looking at what it was that the clergy was doing for them. So in this particular church, because it's really a square, we thought that putting a circle within the square, which is an ancient uh, pattern that connects the heavens and the earth, the circle symbolizing the heavens, which is eternal, no beginning, no end, and a square, which reminds us of the four corners of the earth, meaning uh, this planet. So the connection between this planet and the heavens is a very important symbolism in this church. And if you've noticed, our ceiling uh, is painted with a lot of stars to remind us again that we are part of a larger creation, which we attribute to, to God. So this church building, we think, 
is really a marvelous example of contemporary Roman Catholic Church art and architecture. I want to say one more word about it. We've also uh, commissioned eight brand new icons, and they are icons of men and women who are selected by this congregation. We call them saints, and they complete the circle, one might say. So they are part of our congregation. And in the Catholic Church, the catechism uh, reminds us this question, what is the church if not the communion of saints? The communion of saints is the church. So we feel that this, this particular building is really a wonderful example of a Roman Catholic place of worship. And by the way, it just took an international award for this particular design. What's important about my particular career and my particular role in helping congregations build and renovate churches is based not only on my academic credentials, but also my experience. And that's another difficult thing for young persons in high school or just coming out of college to understand. One of the things that's going to help you get a job is not only your academic credentials, but also your experience in the field. And so I actually rely more on my experience in the field as a kind of a license to help people uh, design their own places of worship. In fact, I am not a licensed architect. That is to say, I am not registered to practice architecture. And I'd rather have it that way. And I'll tell you why. There are a lot of rules and regulations that one has to follow when you are licensed. My approach is to tap into the spirit of a congregation. Uh, it'd be like tapping into the, the history, the stories of your clients, whatever it is that you're going to do, whether you're making a sandwich at, at McDonald's or, or, or someplace else, or whether you're going to be a financial manager for someone investing their portfolio, or whether you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. The important thing is to know what the rules and regulations are, to know what the laws are, but also to start with the needs and expectations of the people you are working for. And so I have this interdisciplinary background. I've studied philosophy, I've studied education, I've studied art, I've studied architecture, I've studied worship patterns, ritual behavior of people. And it's this vast interdisciplinary background that makes my particular occupation extremely unique not to mention the fact that I'm also a practicing Roman Catholic priest. And so it's a sort of a, an identity that is not shared by too many other people. And once again, in speaking to you or to any other high school student, I know there's a lot on your minds in terms of just passing your exams, but the important thing is to look to the future to see how you might establish an interdisciplinary background that is really going to help you create a safety valve for whatever it is that you're going to do. What I do when I help with a congregation is first of all to listen to their needs and expectations. The second thing that's very, very important then is to document their needs and expectations to help them understand what is the most appropriate environment for worship in their particular tradition, whether it be Jews or, or Christians. The next thing that I would help them do is establish an entire design team. I would help them look for architects, artists, and so forth in order to build or renovate a place. So for example, here, we work together with the committee to find the right iconographer who wrote these icons that you see in the background here. We worked very hard to get the right architectural team to help us carry this out as well. So that's one of my, the main features of my work. Then I also create the drawings, uh, the drawings for the particular place of worship. So the whole project starts with a concept up here that develops then into a full set of legitimate architectural drawings from which we can build or renovate the space. I'm from the old school. I do not use any uh, computer-assisted design programs like SketchUp or Revit or any of the others that are available today. You're absolutely right in a sense that I'm from the old school. I like to put pencil to paper first of all. 
And then I want to be clear, my ideas, my concepts then are given to an architectural or a design team and they then using computers, they will in a sense clean up my drawings uh, and, and apply all of the appropriate codes and requirements in order to make the building stand and work. The favorite part of my job is listening and talking to people. As a priest here in this parish, that's what I like to do. I like to listen to the people's needs, and as I preach, I try to respond to their needs and expectations. When I'm working as an architectural and liturgical consultant, it's the very same thing trying to listen to their needs and their expectations rather than telling them what to do. Uh, of course, I have a lot of ideas of my own, but the important thing is to start listening to the people. So my favorite part of my work, whether it's a priest or a consultant, is the people part.